Morning, Just Capital out with its Just 100 list, a ranking of America's most just companies. CNBC is Just Capital's media partner. And joining us right now in an exclusive interview is Paul Tudor Jones, Tudor Investment founder and chief investment officer. Paul is also the founder and chairman of Just Capital. And here at the table is Hewlett Packard Enterprises CEO Antonio Neri. Uh, HPE is ranked number one at the tippy top of the list of the Just 100 this year. Good morning to both of you. Uh, Paul, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to you first to sort of just walk through, if you could, how the Just Capital list is different to the extent you think it is in 2024 relative to the prior years and, and the shifting sort of winds of what is important to folks. Well, first of all, congratulations to Antonio for him being number one, his company being number one in the rankings. And it's, I would say that this year, it's not a, a huge shift in terms of how the rankings played out. It's more of a glacial move. Clearly the number one issue for Americans, and it's doubled since 2010. The number one issues, according to Americans, is all work-related issues. And right at the top is, uh, and with 18% of our whole ranking is pays of pays a fair and living wage. So HPE, HPE, they just do well in every single category. Um, one that strikes me particularly is they have in the entire Russell 1000, they have the most generous maternal and paternity leaves that there are. And I say that for me personally because this year as a newly minted grandfather, three of all three of my daughters all three had grandchildren. So watching them hover over those babies for the better part of the first three to six months of their lives and watching their husbands have the ability to interact with those babies, it was not just a, a touching and a heartwarming moment, but I just realized what a huge edge it is for those kids in life. We know, I know, we all know how important early childhood is. I think most of the brain synapses are formed and their cognitive abilities by the time, by the time they're age uh, five. So yes, that to me, at least as far as HPA, HPE went, particularly struck right. uh, a beautiful spot because I, I just see it real time with my daughters and their husbands. Right. Antonio, let me ask you this. We are at a, a, a moment where there's been a lot of layoffs in the tech industry. A lot of folks even looked, I think, at what Meta did in terms of yep. really sort of um, culling things. And actually, by the way, maybe getting even some mojo as a result of that. People looked at what Elon Musk did with Twitter. And there's a real sort of sense of maybe being ruthless is being good. Yeah. Um, you are not that. And so I, I'm curious how you, how you juxtapose these two ideas right now. Yeah. Well, first of all, we are maniacal focus on driving operational efficiency and operating leverage for our shareholders. But at the end, I think about our people are our greatest assets, and ultimately they are the one that deliver the value to our shareholders. So first of all, I want to thank Paul and the Just Capital for this amazing recognition. I know our 60,000 employees all over the world will, us, will, will celebrate this today, but ultimately we are doubling down in our workforce. Um, as a CEO and an engineer, I always said we compete with the best people, the best talent, which obviously is very stiff out there to attract the talent and the best technology. So for us, it's doubling down, reskilling, giving people the opportunity to grow in their career, to learn, and you know, in, also implement new programs. In fact, I grew up as an apprentice in my life. Um, and so we believe in those uh, type of programs to reskill and grow from there. So here's the question. I'm if, curious about governance as you look uh, as somebody overseeing this, this just list. And uh, one of the big governance questions that's in the headlines is that of Elon Musk and whether uh, that board is independent, uh, whether he's controllable, uh, Wall Street Journal reporting that he's on drugs, taking drugs with the board members. Uh, what, what do you think of this, if, if this is true? Well, I would say, uh, if, I, if, I, if my facts are right, I think two or three weeks ago, Elon said that he'd like to have 25% controlling interest of the company. I think he's at 13% right now, having sold down a bunch of his uh, a bunch of his holdings over the past couple of years, and I think it's a really, really interesting and important um, watching how this actually 
unfolds is going to be, I think, very telling and informative for the future of the country. If you say that, and really from two levels, the macro level and the micro level. Let's take the macro level first. I think one of the reasons why he wants 25 percent of the company is because he's thinking I can bring my AI robotics. Do I use Tesla as a delivery mechanism for that? And that's going to be uh, hugely important for the future of humanity. Clearly, it's going to be unbelievably productive in a fashion. We know right now that, I guess from a macro level, probably I think the productivity gains that are projected to come from AI will probably double the typical 1.5% annual increase in productivity to maybe 3%. And the big social question is, is how do we take those productivity gains and distribute them through society in a way that allows society to be stable and to grow. So in, in Musk's case, it's particularly intriguing because um, here's the richest guy in the world who's saying, uh, the way that I see AI robotics and the productivity gain that we can garner within Tesla is going to be possibly, and again, we don't know because all it was was from a tweet, possibly, by him incro in increasing his own financial stake. And, and I don't think that this is like a hot dog eating contest where uh, the rich necessarily win by getting that much richer. Um, I don't know, I, I know 74% of Americans, or I think it's actually 83% of Americans think that CEOs already get paid too much. So I don't know how well that's gonna play on Main Street, but more importantly, the big issues facing America going forward are going to be, one, again, productivity, the job right. displacement, estimated to be tens of millions of jobs between now and 2030, as well as how we deal with the right. big debt bomb that we've got coming for us. So just with, again, going back to this particular case, wouldn't it be interesting uh, he wants 25% of the company. Again, it was, a, it, was a, it was a cryptic tweet, but let's assume that he wants more of the company for doing AI robotics. As a hedge fund manager who earns 25%, far be it from me um, right. to throw stones at him for that. But think of this. Here's a guy who sees a thousand years in the future, right? Uh, maybe one of the greatest geniuses of our time. Um, and Yet the governance that he's proposing, at least initially, is kind of from a thousand years ago, right? It's, it's, it's a feudalistic, almost vassalistic proposal in terms of sharing that wealth creation that's going to come from executing on productivity growth. So an alternative, and again, right. uh, an alternative for him would be, what about this idea? What about taking... Because I, I do think with the incredible genius that he's got, with that team of 140,000 employees, imagine what they can do for the rest of humanity. But instead of taking that extra, I guess it's something around 80, 80 billion dollars, something like that, rather than right. taking it just for himself, what if you, in, you start an employee stock ownership program for those 140,000 employees? What if he took... I, tis, I think he has that already, doesn't he? You no, know, he has an employee stock purchase program, which is very different. I mean, it's it's. I mean, an employee stock purchase program where you get to buy the stock at a fifteen percent discount is right. radically different than employee stock ownership plan. Imagine if you took that eighty billion that he thinks um, he can do it anywhere, but let's say he did it with Tesla and he distributed that. Uh, say two thirds or 75 percent of it among 140,000 employees. What you do then is you create 140,000 people who will wake up, eat, breathe, and think Tesla every morning. You're not distributing the pie. So, you're well, actually. He says he wants to do it for a control factor because he wouldn't feel comfortable creating artificial intelligence if he didn't have some sort of voting control over it. So if he takes so, so shares again, and distributes I, them, he doesn't have control again. Yeah, and, and, and I'm fine with that. I think it's the economic aspects of it that are important because we know, 
we know that worker pay is the most important thing. Imagine the life-changing event that would be. Right. I think it would work out to $300,000 per employee. Well, Paul, in, the, in this capitalistic society, well, first of all, let me just go back. If you were the judge in the, in the comp case, you would let him have the money or you wouldn't let him have the money? Are you talking about the Delaware case? The, the Delaware case. Uh, I think the Delaware case is more about process than comp. What, what, what my point to you is, is that we have, we are on the verge of massive social change because right. of AI. We have to think about a way to distribute it, excuse me, to grow it as well as to share in it in a way that is going to be for the best and the betterment of society. In U.S., we already have the greatest wealth inequality. It puts us right next to South Africa in the world. How has wealth inequality historically been solved? It's wealth, excuse me, it's revolution, it's war, or it's taxes. So if in, in this particular case, we have a we have a massive, we're gonna to have to find a trillion dollars in either government government cuts and or taxes. And right. one of the ways that you will find those, one of the ways, certainly on the revenue enhancing side, somewhere down the road. Right now the markets aren't focused on it, but it's gonna happen. One of the ways that you'll do that is gonna be through an increase in a possible implementation of a wealth tax. Counterintuitively, in, in this particular instance, if Musk actually were able to get that board of directors to talk him into uh, an extra $80 billion of compensation solely right. for himself, I think it would be exhibit number one at some point well, in the next four to six years, four to eight years, whenever uh, the, progressive, the progressives take over after some great recession at some right. point. It'd be well, exhibit number one well, for wealth tax. So counterintuitively, I think you'd actually end up losing more money than making more money if okay, it was well, well, ho hopefully, hopefully Elon's uh, watching this and maybe he'll, he'll take your suggestion. I should say, by the way, uh, that he did take to Twitter and say that uh, he's never been tested positive for drugs, just for whatever that's worth. But, but um, can, I, I, can, I, can I just go back? Yeah. I, I do think Just Capital is all about markets. If you think about our two political parties right now, they do not have a vision for the future. It is why Americans are so disaffected with both of them at this point in time. The one thing that Americans do agree, and we see it in our polling and justness, right. excuse me, adjust capital, is they, there's 100% agreement on a variety of corporate issues, on issues such as uh, worker pay, pays a fair and living wage. This is an opportunity, I think, for Mr. Musk to be truly, at least from where I sit, what he'll be remembered for most, to be a pathfinder in showing that the markets themselves can sort out the best way to keep society stable by making sure that all stakeholder, stakeholders, employees, customers, right. communities benefit from what these companies do and produce. He's got to get everybody to Mars before he gets that done. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me just ask you this, Antonio, just, uh, and I, I also want to get uh, Paul's take just on the economy and the markets and what we heard from uh, Jay Powell last night. But I wanted to ask you what you're seeing in terms of in the enterprise space. Yeah. Businesses spending capital right now or not? What's the, what's the confidence factor? I think, you know, enterprises continue to focus on what is important to them from a technology perspective to advance productivity. Obviously, AI is at the top of that list, right. to improve cybersecurity, to continue to digitize their enterprise and to use data in a way they but have you see, So are you seeing people doubling down? You see seeing people... No, I see more steady and, and markets in transition where priorities continue to shift. Obviously, there has been a period of large digestion in right. the last 18 months because of the supply chain challenges. But when I think about the biggest opportunities in the market today, definitely AI, cybersecurity, connectivity continue to right. be top of the list. Paul, I don't know if you saw 60 Minutes last night with Jay Powell. Do you have a, a take on, on what the Fed's doing right now, whether we're uh, going to have a soft landing here or whether something else is going to happen as the year progresses? Well, you know, I, I, look, I, to me, there are two huge themes going forward. I don't know whether they'll manifest themselves this year. I kind of think one of them will. Um, but the, the two big macro themes going forward are going to be 
Um, the debt bomb that we have in the United States, the, the, the fiscal recklessness and how we ultimately reconcile that versus uh, the productivity gains that, that we're going to get from AI, which should be stunning and stupendous over the next few years. So those are the two, that, that's kind of uh, Sila and Karibdi. Those are the two forces clashing, clashing with each other. Um, and I look at Fed policy right now as being cyclical rather than secular. Cyclical in the sense that we're looking at the current economic metrics, growth versus inflation, uh, growth and inflation, where I think there's, there, there are larger issues that we're going to be focusing on somewhere down the road. And it's going to be around how do we stop and close the fiscal deficits that we right. have, as well as, again, how do we use AI to benefit all Americans, not just the five or 10,000 extraordinarily brilliant people who are going to change our lives with it? Final question for you, Paul. Grade the economy. God, it's just great, I think. I mean, I think it's, I think it's strong. But again, I think if you, why shouldn't it be? We've got a we've got a six seven percent budget deficit. We're fast forwarding consumption like crazy. It should be going bankbusters because we've got uh, an economy on steroids and it's and it's unsustainable. As Jay Powell said in his interview, his very smooth interview, it's we're on an unsustainable path and we're going to have we're going to have to stop it. Uh, and the only question is is does that manifest itself in the markets? When or when does that manifest itself in its markets? It could be this year. It could be next year. Productivity may mask, and it might be three or four years from now. But clearly, right. clearly, we're on an unsustainable path. Okay. Uh, Paul, we need to thank you. Antonio, I want to thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that was an interesting interview of Paul Tudor Jones. The CEO of Hewlett Packard was also on. So a little bit about Paul. Um, he's a self-made American billionaire and known for his macro hedge fund strategies, his philanthropic endeavors. And after starting his career trading cotton futures, he founded Tudor Investment Corporation in 1980, which manages over $13 billion today. He's known for his bold bets on currencies and interest rates like his successful shorting of the 1987 Black Monday crash. And beyond finance, he co-founded the Robin Hood Foundation to fight poverty and just capital, which ranks companies based on their social impact. And his net worth is $8.1 billion. He remains an influential figure in finance and has a passionate, uh, is a passionate advocate for social good. So let's take a look at the stock charts. Uh, we're going to look at Hewlett Packard. We're going to look at Tesla. And we're going to just uh, do a, just a brief uh, summary of what's happening today. It is currently 3.36 p.m. on Monday, February 5th, as I'm recording this. So... The market has not closed yet, but as you can see, Tesla is down about 4%, Amazon down 1%, Meta down 2.2, Google up 1%, Apple up 1.3. And, uh, you know, the, the markets did drop this morning, but at around 11 a.m. they started to recover, but they're still all down a bit uh, with Russell 2000 down the most by 0.82%. So. Let's look at Hewlett Packard. We'll start off with that first. Let's look at the weekly chart on Hewlett Packard. Uh, HPE has been sort of in a range now for a while. It's inside the Kumo cloud on the weekly chart. Um, and uh, apparently the sales growth rate is down a little bit. Um, but let's look at the daily chart. Uh, not looking particularly good here on the daily either. Not an op opportune time to enter, in my uh, opinion. Uh, as you can see, price is below the Kumo cloud. Let's look at the 30 minute. Yeah, it's been down today, 0.78%. All right, now let's take a look. And this is the monthly chart, just so you can get a sense of where it's been. It's, I mean, it's just been hovering between, you know, around $20 level, you know, and around uh, $11 for quite a while. Maybe if it breaks above these levels, like the $20 level, this might be an interesting stock to look into. Tesla on the monthly chart, not looking particularly good. As you can see, this is what's happening. Um, during the month of January, price closed under the Kumo cloud. Tankinson under the Kijinson. 
and uh, you know we, we have a lower high here that is developed we don't have a lower low yet on the monthly but we do on the weekly all right so we've been in this downtrend as you can see here with lower highs lower lows not good price uh, three weeks ago closed under the Kumo cloud and is remaining under there it's down 4.09 as you can see so this on the daily chart you know just a very strong downtrend um, with the you know you can see the negative di line is still moving up positive di line moving down that's uh, not good and the volume is increasing down below here so uh, I guess we can look at the 30 minute too. I mean, it's just also not looking great on the 30 minute. Look at how many days it's been under the Kumo cloud. It's been under there since uh, December 29th of 2023. That's the 30 minute time frame. So it's been a very, you know, just a ferocious down downfall here for, for a bit. Anyway, uh, with all that positive news there, just kidding. Um, hope you guys had a good day today. If you liked this video, want to see more videos just like it, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I appreciate it. I will catch you all in the next video.